Good morning, loved ones. I would like to welcome you all to Spirit of Hope. I am Pastor Christine Jones, and I am glad that you are here. I'd also like to welcome our participants online. We are so happy that you could join us. No matter the reason that brought you to Spirit of Hope, I know that God has something special in store for you, something that you really need. Let us open ourselves to the message that God is sharing with us today. Let us worship God. Since I've never done it, got it. As you can all see, I've got a face made for radio. That's why I sit in the back. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, would you join me in the call to worship, please? My friends, a mighty wind has blown. The Holy Spirit has come. Let us open our hearts to the Spirit. Amen. I would like to take a moment to give time for a Memorial Day remembrance. Memorial Day often passes in our churches with little or no mention. Historically and traditionally, it has been viewed as a civic observance rather than a liturgical one. However, giving attention to Memorial Day can be a time of healing hurt and connecting with the rawness of loss. It offers us the opportunity to get outside of our church bubble and to be present with and to others as they struggle to come to terms with war, loss, devastation, and what it all means. As you entered the room, you may have noticed a special table here in a place of honor. It is set for one. This table is our way of symbolizing that members of our community are missing from our midst. It is reserved to honor our missing men and women as a part of our Memorial Day recognition. This table is in honor of the prisoners of war and missing in action who are unable to be with us. Let me explain the meaning of this table, and then I'll invite you to join me in a moment of prayer. The table is round to show our everlasting concern. The cloth is white, symbolizing the purity of their motives when answering the call to serve. The single red rose reminds us of the lives of these Americans and their loved ones and friends who keep the faith while seeking answers. The yellow ribbon symbolizes our continued uncertainty, hope for their return, and determination to account for them and bring them home. A slice of lemon reminds us of their bitter fate, captured and missing in a foreign land. A pinch of salt symbolizes the tears of our missing and their families who long for answers after decades of uncertainty. The lighted candle reflects our hope for their return, alive or dead. The Bible represents the strength gained through faith to sustain us and those lost from our country, founded as one nation under God. The glass is inverted to symbolize their inability to share a toast, and the chair is empty. They are not here. Almighty God and most merciful Father, as we remember these your servants, remembering with gratitude their courage and strength, we hold before you those who mourn them. Look upon your bereaved servants with your mercy, as this day brings them memories of those they have lost a while. 
May it also bring your consolation and the assurance that their loved ones are alive now and forever in your living presence. Amen. I believe it is time for us to sing the children in parade to the children's Sunday school class. Please, Kathy. For the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. him, God of grace and God of glory.
As we move into a time to share our joys and concerns, we will be passing the microphone to make sure that everyone can hear, including those who are joining us online. I would like to invite prayers for Daphne, who let me know this morning that she may have strep throat, so please keep her in your prayers. I would also like to ask for prayers for the Reyes family, who suffered a miscarriage at nine months and are currently grieving. I would also like to invite prayers for Nancy and John. You may know Nancy. She is fairly new to us. John was rushed to the ER on Saturday morning. Um, he has pneumonia and one of his lungs has collapsed. So please keep these wonderful, beautiful members of our family in your prayers. And travel mercies for Judy. Mike Williams texted this morning that Sherry is at Basel Hospital in the ER. She's been having breathing problems for several several months, uh, and and she's been referred to a pulmonologist and to a cardiologist. So he texted a second time and said that she was doing better, and he thought that she was going to be discharged from the ER and not admitted. So I also want to say a joy is seeing uh, Patty coming, sitting in there, sitting over there. I would like to uh, ask for prayers for Pastor Christine and family, for her health, for change of what's happening in her life, and to thank her for her faithfulness uh, in leading this congregation, her faithfulness to the Lord, to all of us, but to pray for her, because this is quite a change. And prayers for you, this church, because you'll be going through change too with a new pastor and uh, I believe a new time. Are they going to <laughs> nine in the morning? Uh, so prayers for all of you in this beautiful congregation. Uh, the love that you all have. So prayers for you. But pr 
prayers and gratitude to you, Pastor. Thank you. Yes. I'd like a prayer of remembrance for Captain Charles Walling, who was my POW bracelet and never returned. He was lost in August 8th, 1966. Absolutely. Thank you, Wayne. Tina. Well, my leg has gotten better, but still I need more prayers for my knees. Basically, I think it stems from my knees. So prayers for both my knees that um, the doctors know what to do. And so, and then also I've got to bring up last weekend my... One of my dogs uh, passed away at home after 16 years of a good long life. So, but it's it's hard because I've had him for a long time, and it was my daughter's dog. She got it when she was uh, in Tucson at the U of A, and that was her little baby. And now it became mine, and he's he's in doggy heaven now. Now that we have shared some joys and a lot of very heavy concerns, let us center ourselves with a hymn of prayer. How manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. Open your hand to us, O God, giver of good things. Do not hide your face from us. Should you remove your spirit from us, we shall surely return to the dust. Send forth your spirit in this worship service today and let us be recreated. Renew us, O God, with your spirit. Lord, our loads are heavy with worry, with regret, with fatigue, with illness, with sorrow, with despair for all in the world that is hurting, in danger, in bondage, and more. We lift up our friends. We lift up our family. We lift up the members of our community who are in need of you. We lift up those who are written on our hearts and minds both those we spoke of and those who remain unspoken. And we know that you will be with them. We pray this for ourselves, for one another, and for the world in which we live in. We pray in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray as one family. 
saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So nice to see all of your faces. I always see the back of your heads. Okay, so today we're dealing with the proclamation of God's word. We'll be covering Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. John uh, chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. And the pastor owes me for this one. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a howling I'm sorry, sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were standing. They saw what seemed to be the tongues of fire that had separated and come to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all of these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears in our own native language? Parthenians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphy Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts Juda to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in their own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, What does this mean? Some, however, made fun and said, <laughs> They've had too much wine. John, chapter 20, verses 19 to 23. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, and I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. The word of God for the people of God. Holy God, Spirit of love, fill us with your love. Holy God, Dove of Pentecost, strengthen our faith, our witness, and fill us with your power. Holy God, Breath of joy, renew our worship, touch our hearts, and bring us your peace. Amen. Today, we have the story of two Pentecosts. Two accounts of receiving the Spirit, two sides of our own story, two retellings of our own varied experiences. There are the times, the glorious times, the wonderful times, the exuberant times, when the Spirit overwhelms us and we are set on fire. Times when we are shouting in languages we don't really know. There are times when the joy spills from us and the laughter pours from us and we can't help but be carried away by the wonder and glory of the God that we worship. And there are other times. The breath of peace, the breath of joy, the touching of our hearts, the quiet Pentecost. Today we will look at both 
as a uniting presence to be celebrated this day. Because observing Pentecost means to overcome barriers and divisions. Differences become signs of the artistry of God and not reasons to be afraid. Strangers are not enemies to be opposed, but sisters and brothers to be embraced and included. This is a day where we remember that spirit, wind, and breath are all part of the same experience and that life itself is a gift from God and a sign of God's goodness and presence in our lives. We share in common the need to breathe. We are impacted by the same wind. We share in the same spirit. Today we breathe in our unity and celebrate our oneness with God and one another. This is the day he breathed on us. Jewish law required Jewish people to observe three pilgrimage festivals. Annual festivals in Jerusalem that Jewish men were expected to attend. Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, observed in March, April. These were originally two festivals, but by the New Testament times, they had become one. They had been combined. These celebrated the Exodus. The Feast of Weeks, observed toward the end of May or the beginning of June, also known as the Feast of the Harvest or the Day of the First Fruits, and the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles, observed in late September or early October. This was a harvest festival celebrating the ingathering of the crops. So Jewish law required that Jewish people observe the Feast of Weeks, the first feast, feast of harvest and the Feast of the First Fruits. Pentecost. Pentecost was commonly thought to follow Passover by 50 days. Pente is the Greek word for five, and Pentecost is for 50. However, Leviticus 23, which appoints the Jewish festival, specifies that Passover and unleavened bread are to be celebrated on a fixed date each year. First fruits is next, the other name for the Feast of Weeks. It's celebrated after the harvest starts. First fruits does not have a fixed date because the harvest must wait for the ripening of the grain. Leviticus ties the Feast of Weeks to first fruits rather than Passover, saying, You shall count from the next day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. Seven weeks plus one day constitutes the 50 days associated with Pentecost. So Pentecost is 50 days after first fruits rather than 50 days after Passover. The instructions in Deuteronomy are essentially the same, specifying that the Feast of Weeks is from the time you begin to put the sickle to the standing grain, you shall begin to number seven weeks. The Gospel according to Luke and the Acts of the Apostles were written by the same author, with Acts picking up where Luke left off. This is important because these two books viewed together can show us how deeply rooted in the Gospel of Luke that Pentecost is. The gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2 fulfills the prophecy of John the Baptist in Luke's Gospel. He will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. Jesus alludes to the gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost when he told his disciples to wait in the city of Jerusalem until you are clothed with power from on high. Jesus began his ministry spirit-filled, and so does the church. Pentecost is the day that the church celebrates its birth and the gift of the Holy Spirit. The first scripture for today's reading is the early part of Peter's sermon. At the time of this sermon, Peter is not yet open to bringing Gentiles into the church. This sermon was intended for Jews. Jews from all over the world, including converts, but only for Jews. It is later in Acts that the church will be open to all flesh, to Jews and Gentiles, women and men, people of every color, slaves and free. But for this early text, we need to know that he is speaking to the Jews. The passage opens with fulfillment. Jesus had promised in Acts 1 verse 5, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And in verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witness 
in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So we have this major festival in which Jews living near Jerusalem are required to attend and to which Jews from other nations make pilgrimage as they are able. As many as 180,000 people attending, two-thirds from foreign lands. The passage says that they were all together in one place. This implies that they are speaking about the 120 disciples as opposed to only the apostles. They had moved outside to be able to speak to many people. And the spirit moves. Now Jesus had just departed. We need to recall how these followers, our early Christian brothers and sisters, would feel at this moment. Jesus has just left. Fear. The very despair that they are drenched in as they're coming to grips with a life without his presence among them. They had a taste of life, of living fully of being alive like they'd never known possible, and now it was gone. He had left. And then comes this sound that shakes them to their very core, a sound like a desert wind blasting sand into a scouring force, a roar, but not an oppressive roar, not an angry roar, a wind-like hope, blowing through their despair like the wind drying fresh-washed sheets hanging on a line, lifting in this fluttering wind of a new day, filling them. Remember that feeling, that joyous certainty. Remember flying on the wind of faith and for a moment believing in eternity like you could feel it bearing you up with grace and fire. Remember the fire. Remember the fire in your bones that you had to let out in laughter and movement and action. Luke writes, that it was divided tongues as of fire that settled on each of them. But we need to be careful of the word divided. This is not a separation or an individualism. This is inclusion. The tongues reached out like octopus arms, wanting to gather in, to bind together, to make all as one. This was an individual experience that had a corporate reality. They were each in this together. They were all as if they were one. In the past, God had set his spirit on a chosen few, but in the era that begins with the first Christian Pentecost, God gives the spirit to all who belong to the believing community. This is a fire that unites, a blaze that leaps from one to another and to all. This is a fire that builds up, not one that destroys Unless what is destroyed is all that would keep us from leaning into the joy of this day. All of this was glorious and unexpected. They speak in other languages, in other tongues. This is the Spirit giving them the ability to speak so that they can share the message, so that they can proclaim the gospel to share their story, God's story, the story of Jesus with everyone around them. Everyone present was able to hear the story in their own language. We see that later in this chapter, 3,000 members of this crowd would be baptized at the conclusion of the sermon, ready to carry the word of their Pentecost experience and their testimony of Jesus to every corner of the world. Pentecost was originally an agricultural festival celebrating the first harvest of the growing season. Important times of celebration, to be sure, but nothing to indicate the power that was to be unleashed on this day. I'm sure it caught the disciples by surprise, too. They were used to the low-key holiday, not like Yom Kippur or Rosh Hashanah, but instead found themselves in an encounter with God that literally blew them away. The day of Pentecost came like the sound of a violent wind, Luke tells us. It was fire. It was power. It was chaos. It was noise. But it was also meaning and it was hope. And then to be filled with the power, the filled, filled with the power to be, the power to grow, the power to love as Christ loved. That's what Pentecost was all about. Not simply a birthday commemoration not just a marker along the road, a milestone past. It is a moment of power, an offering of transformation. So how about it? Are you ready to come to church on Sundays? 
Who knows what you might be once you've been windswept with the Holy Spirit? Except that sometimes it's hard to rise to the occasion of this kind of Pentecost. Well watched children waving streamers will smile as the dancers dance and even be standing in awe of depictions of fire dancing across our screens. But the breath within us is not always a mighty wind. Sometimes it's more like a sigh. A sigh of pain or a sigh of sadness or a sigh of grief or of uncertainty or of fear. Not a gust, but a sigh. Just a sigh. It's profound, huh? Just where you thought my sermon was going to go today. The gem of wisdom that is going to really help you wrap your mind and soul around the taste of God's word today. Just a sigh. Maybe it is more than weariness and exasperation. Maybe there is a hint of contentment. Can such things be? Contentment is a rare commodity, often frustratingly just out of reach. If I can just get this done, if I can just accomplish these goals, if I can just acquire these items, if I can just save this amount of money, if I can just master these skills, if I could just finish, then, maybe then, perhaps then, I might find that sense of contentment. But in the meantime, there's work to be done, miles to travel, burdens to bear, struggles to endure, and on and on and on and on. Contentment isn't a word that speaks into our experience these days. Life is too hectic, too shallow, too empty, too hungry. Except sometimes, once in a while, like a breath, Like a cool breeze on a hot day, it's just there from somewhere. And we turn to John and the other quieter filling of the Holy Spirit. John speaks to the disciples three times. Each time, Jesus speaks to the disciples three times. And each time, his words give power to those who hear him. This gospel tells us that the disciples are gathered, but not which disciples. In Luke's parallel telling of this story, it is the 11 and those who are with them. In John's gospel, given Thomas's absence, it is likely the 10 and their companions. This gospel shows us that there are different kinds of faith. And this faith comes in different ways, with differing intensities to differ differing people. The beloved disciple believes upon seeing the empty tomb. Mary believes when the Lord calls her name. The disciples must see the risen Lord, and Thomas says he must touch Jesus' wounds, although that need seems to evaporate once he sees the risen Christ. People have differing needs and find various roots to faith. Now this encounter with the Holy Spirit is Easter evening, the same day that the disciples saw the empty tomb and Mary saw Jesus. This is consistent with Luke's account where Jesus encountered two disciples on the Emmaus road that same day, which was the first day of the week. Once the disciples recognized Jesus, he vanished out of their sight. They rose up that very hour, returned to Jerusalem, and found the eleven gathered there and those who were with them. As they said these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be to you. The disciples met in a room in Jerusalem, locked for fear of the Jews. The locked door reflects that fear of the disciples, but it also demonstrates the power of the risen Christ, who could neither be contained by a rock tomb nor a locked door. It's a little surprising that the disciples are still afraid because Peter and the other disciples have seen the empty tomb. Mary Magdalene has spoken with the risen Christ and has told the disciples of her experience. However, even after the other disciple has seen and believed, it's still not clear 
what he believes, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Furthermore, the disciples are still traumatized by the crucifixion and are frightened concerning what might happen next. Their fear disappoints us because they're acting like disciples whose leader is dead. However, after they see the risen Christ and receive the Holy Spirit, they will be transformed and emboldened. So Jesus appears among them and gives his peace, even as he has promised. The disciples will have peace in spite of persecution by a world that will hate them, even as it hates Jesus. The peace of the Lord be with you. When he had shared his peace, he showed them the wounds on his body to confirm that it is he. Resurrected, he was standing before them alive and well. The man that they had seen so recently crucified. Earlier, Jesus warned the disciples that they would weep and mourn and experience pain. But then he promised, your sorrow will be turned into joy. A joy so profound that they would forget their former pain. This visit of Jesus to the disciples, then, is the beginning of the fulfillment of that promise. The disciples did indeed weep and mourn and experience pain when Jesus was arrested and crucified, but now their pain has turned into joy at seeing Jesus alive once again. This is also a turning point for the disciples. Never again will they be fearful and unbelieving. Jesus gives the disciples this peace a second time, and then says, as the Father has sent me, even so I send you. Earlier in his prayer for the disciples in chapter 17, Jesus prayed, as you sent me into the world, even so I have sent them into the world. Now he makes it explicit to the disciples what he has spoken of in that prayer. God is present in the work of Jesus. Jesus will be present in the work of the disciples. It is a passing of the baton. It is a designation of succession. However, to send these disciples into the world alone would be futile. So Jesus prepares them by breathing on them or breathing into them. Just as God breathed into man the breath of life, Jesus breathes into the disciples the Holy Spirit. This gift of the Spirit renews the life of these disciples. They've been afraid and confused, hidden in a locked room to escape danger, and now they find the strength to stand up, unlock the door, go outside, and begin their proclamation. Jesus breathed on them. Peace be with you. He breathed on them. Breathing peace. Receiving the Holy Spirit, the Spirit he commended to God, the Spirit returned to us in a breath, peace. Breathe on me. In the heat of the moment, in the struggle of living and loving and finding our way in a complicated world, breathe on me. Give me peace. Not a peace that resolves every issue. Not a peace that fixes everything that is broken or that removes responsibility or covenant, that answers every question or removes every doubt, breathe on me that I might find peace. That I might find peace enough to continue on the journey on which I find myself. Peace enough to work toward resolution. Peace enough to mend the broken or that allows me to limp with grace and confidence. Peace that breathes through my responsibilities and covenants. Peace that lifts up and binds together. Peace that casts out fear. Perfect love. Peace casts out fear. And where does it come from, this peace? Is it self-generated? Are there disciplines we can practice, rituals we can perform? Well, yes, there are rituals. There's corporate prayer, sacraments of grace, Yes, there are disciplines, meditations that call on us, and worship, study that drives us into deeply into the living word, these and more. But no, we don't create this peace. We receive it like a breath that comes from elsewhere, from beyond us. 
The rituals and the dis disciplines are designed to shape us into vessels better able to hold on to the peace that breathes into us. It is a gift, a joy, an unexpected encounter, a cool breeze that fills the sails and sends us across the horizon into new worlds of love and joy. A promise from one side of life is fulfilled from the other. A description, an image, a story told to a hurting and hungry heart, which becomes a wind of change in a new world. He breathed on them. Peace be with you. Receive the spirit of holiness, of ordination, of mission, of ministry, of love. Receive it and then love. Love from the center of peace, from the contentment of faith, of putting your hands in the source of love and joy and peace. Lean into it, trust it, and receive it. He breathed on them. He breathed on you. He breathed on me. Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life anew that I may love what thou dost love and do what thou wouldst do. Breathe on me, breath of God, till I am wholly thine. Till all this earthly part of me glows with the fire divine. Breathe on us all, Lord. Breathe on us all. Amen. We have come to that time in our service where we offer ourselves and our gifts to God. I would like to invite our ushers to come forward to collect the plates. God of wind and flame, set us on fire this morning as we celebrate the explosion of your Holy Spirit coming into the world on the day of Pentecost. Remind us that the gift you gave that day was not just the gift to speak in different tongues, but also the gift of hearing and comprehension. May your Holy Spirit keep us attuned to the voices all around us, to those who need us to be bearers of your love and compassion and may these gifts we give help us through the church meet those needs.
In the holy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Jesus invites you now to come to the table. This is not my table or Spirit of Hope's table, but it is the Lord's table. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Lift up your hearts and give thanks to God. Blessed are you, O God, who with your word and Holy Spirit created all things and called them good. In Jesus Christ, your word became flesh and dwelt among us. Through Jesus' suffering and death, you took upon yourself our sin and death and destroyed their power forever. You raised from the dead this same Jesus who now reigns with you in glory and poured upon us your Holy Spirit, making us the people of your new covenant. On the night before meeting with death, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to the disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. As we proclaim the mystery of faith, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Will those who are assisting with communion please come forward? I would like to invite our prayer advocates to come forward so that you may take up your position in the rear of the worship center. Our prayer advocates are ready to pray with you at your need following your communion. Please prepare yourself as you come forward with your hands ready for the elements. The table is set. Come as you are ready.
Please join me in the communion prayer. God of freedom, we praise you for our many blessings. As you have fed us with this simple meal of bread and wine, send us your spirit to remind us that every person is your person, that every child is your child. Enable us to be peacemakers, that your kingdom, which has no boundaries, will become a reality for all people. We pray this in the name of the one who came for all. Amen. Just a few announcements in the life of our church family. We have a trustees work day next Saturday. You are invited to come out and help where you are able. You are also invited to help with the Justice Center sack meals. We will be providing 60 sacks, sack meals on the first Tuesday of each month from June through September. Uh, we will begin by assembling the sack meals on Sunday, June 4th, after the morning worship service. They will be refrigerated and delivered to the Justice Center on Tuesday. Many hands make light work. I invite you to join. The members of the youth mission trip have an announcement to make. Cherry? This one. Yes, this one's live. <laughs> All right. I want to uh, introduce my friends. This is Cassidy, and this is Lily, and this is Lorelei. Uh, we are selling stock today. Uh, on our upcoming youth mission trip. So, Lily, where are we going? Um, Ventura, California. And Cassidy, where did we go last year? Kanab, <laughs> Utah. And we have several people in our congregation who have been on previous trips. Uh, Nathan has been on a bunch. Uh, Howard and Susan have been on a bunch. Ada has been, she's got a shirt just like this one. Uh, Paul went last year to Kanab, so we, we have about 33 kids and, and adults from four different churches, so we will be leaving June the 11th uh, and going to California. We fund our trips by selling stock in our trips. Everybody who buys stock in any amount from 50 cents to $400 or more uh, becomes a shareholder in the trip. So we will be selling stock after the service. By the way, they've invited their cousin to go, so uh, Riley is going with us. Very nice. Last week, we had a uh, discussion on the proposal for development of the church's excess property. So I'm going to ask that you email any questions that you may have concerning the trustees' proposal for development of the church's excess property to Lorraine Iyer, who will coordinate the questions and get the answers from the trustees so that the questions and answers can be shared with the entire congregation in the Visionary and Friends and Family Facebook page. The trustees will be scheduling a follow-up discussion in a few weeks and ask that you give prayerful consideration to this development and bring your concerns and questions so that everything is transparent and clear for everyone involved. Finally, you are invited to join in a time of fellowship in the Simonson Miller Fellowship Hall following the service. Stop by and have a spot of coffee, perhaps a small snack, before you go out into the world on fire. What did I miss? Oh, yes. We need volunteers to help run the technology. We need camera people. We need people who are willing to run easy worship. Uh, Mike, you went through the training of how to do the live stream. Was it terribly difficult or were the steps pretty clear? So it is doable. We invite the more people who volunteer, the more often you can actually change who's doing it. You know, maybe once a week or once a month kind of thing instead of once a week. And more people getting involved 
makes it a little easier. It's not as scary as you think. And I did print the instructions, larger print. So if anybody would like to take a look at them. All right. Thank you for that reminder. Please rise in body or in spirit. Wait, I got to do my little thing first. (laughs) So now we leave this space of worship. And while so much of the road ahead is uncertain, the path constantly changing, we know some things that are as solid and sure as the ground beneath our feet and the sky above our heads. We know that God is love. We know Christ's light endures. We know the Holy Spirit is there, found in the space between all things, closer to us than our next breath, binding us to each other until we meet again. Go in peace, go in hope, and go in love, filled with the breath of Christ. And all of God's shining breaths said, Amen. Amen. Now.